78, from the ashes, sort of. Ahem, I glanced up at Celine, I can't really make drones to catch me the test suit, cough escaping cultists. Could you collect some for me? Sure. Celine looked at me weirdly. Was there something weird on my face? Thanks, I smiled at her. Okay then, she shrugged and let go of the man, letting my TK take over from her. See you later? Yes, I gave her a wave. I'll have an interesting story to tell too. Sure, she shrugged. I am curious why you are like that. Uh huh, I hummed, bye. Then she was off, throwing another curious glance at me. There must be something on my face. I reached up patting down my cheeks, chin, hair, ears. Everything was there. Do I look weird? I asked the woman, who was still holding her malnourished daughter behind her like a protective mama bear. No? She was giving me looks mirroring Celine's. Really? I tilted my head, turning my psychic senses on myself for a moment, just to make sure. Aha! Uh -huh. My facial structure was all wrong, I still looked similar enough to my psyker form to be easily recognizable, but my cheekbones were a bit too high, my chin was a bit too low and my nose was a bit too wide. Plus I had freckles on my cheeks. God I hate freckles. If there was one thing that topped the list of things I wanted to change about myself in my previous life, it was freckles. They were worse than my all-too-wide nose or my boring shade of brown hair. Thankfully, a quick surge of bioenergy washed away those imperfections and brought me closer to my ideal image. I conjured up a small mirror, psychic illusions being more than capable of the task. Hmm, I turned my face left and right. It will do for now. Excuse me, spoke up the woman, looking at me like a weird animal. Then she glanced at Bob, suspended midair as he was without being able to twitch as much as a finger. Um, I can see that you wanted him, right? Not quite, I shrugged. I wanted souls to experiment with, and the runaway cultists will serve me well for that. The woman gulped, she'd been staring at me like I'd bite her daughter's head off at any moment. If that could take a turn for the worse, it did as I finished my sentence. So, she cleared her throat, standing up straight and aiming a resolved gaze at me. Can we go then? Go where? I asked, my lips curling in amusement. These caverns are dead ends, and all around us is only wasteland for hundreds of kilometers. I, we, we will find a way, she muttered. Stay here, I offered. In a few hours, I'll open up a portal, leading to Arx Angelicum. You know what that is, right? Why yes, she answered with a trembling voice, her eyes wide in what I thought was disbelief. Yes, thank you. Erm, um, I mean thank you my lady? You are welcome, I smirked. Once again, I am acting like something I am not. It's more of a misunderstanding this time though. Sanctioned psychers were a thing, a known thing. All psychers were feared as witches, or something like that, the populace at large, both feared and hated them, for their abominable power. This of course, applied to those sanctioned by the Imperium. Even if they wouldn't run away screaming or get their pitchforks when they saw a sanctioned psyker, like they'd do with an unsanctioned one, the hate and fear remained. It was something beaten into humans through many millennia of psychers being born and causing calamities. And the Imperium not only doesn't do anything for their sanctioned psychers, they condone the hatred. I got it, I understood it. During the Age of Strife when psyker numbers multiplied rapidly, the only worlds that survived were the ones that put them onto stakes and burned them. I understood it, but I didn't like it. Magic, and warp sorcery was magic in my eyes, was something fantastical, it was something to be loved. I might have been more into science fiction in my last life, but that was mostly because I didn't believe fantasy could become reality. Nanoswarms, arcologies, colonizing Alpha Centauri, and whatever else was something that was within the realms of possibility for humanity's future. Whereas, flinging fireballs and teleporting, was not something I considered possible. Yet here I am, flinging fireballs and teleporting. And so much more. Settle down, I waved her off. We'll be here for a while, and I can't do anything exerting until we get out of this hole. 
Why yes, she nodded, sitting down against the wall and pulling her daughter into her lap. Now I'm giving her a closer look, the girl didn't look too good. I grimaced as I let my psychic senses wash over her, yikes. A flick of my wrist pushed Bob against the wall, I lessened my focus on him and only fixed his four limbs to the wall along with a face mask that kept his mouth shut. Then, I walked over to the two, both of whom were looking at me with a great deal of wariness. I cannot exert myself, I reiterated, but healing her up a bit should be doable, I have enough energy for that. Yes? The mother blinked at me, uncomprehending. Heal her? Is she sick? That she is, I kept the grimace off my face. Sci-fi fantasy gut worms were even more disgusting than the regular ones, no wonder the poor girl was skin and bones. Nothing too severe of course, I can heal her sickness now, but I can't give her back all the weight she'd lost. Please help her. The woman said, begging me. All right, I laid my palm on her abdomen, the little girl shrinking back from my touch, but her mother kept her in place. It won't hurt, you won't feel a thing. Tendrils phased into her body, spreading into a hundred hair-thin tendrils that located every damned worm in the girl. It was honestly disgusting, but it was just a bit of free bioenergy and some good Samaritan work at the same time. Good for the body and good for the soul. Once I was done, I sent a fraction of the new bioenergy back into the girl and fixed any pressing health issues in her. Even if I didn't do another round of healing, which would mostly include me regenerating her muscles and fat, she'd recover if she ate well and slept well for a few months. Should be good, I stood up, patting myself mentally on the back for a job well done. Thanks, I caught the little girl's murmur and sent her a smile. You're welcome. Then it was time for the main course. No, that is a very bad choice of words with me being a man-eating alien, so let's go with the main show, the main attraction. Doesn't have quite the same ring to it. Stop being annoying, I flicked my wrist, raising Bob away from the wall and smashing him back into it. The fucker was trying to twist his joints to get out of the shackle-like bindings I'd put on him. Now, you might be thinking, this guy is like, a hundred years old, don't bully the elderly. But, I could feel the vitality coursing through this fucker, it wasn't much compared to me or even just a regular Astartes, but it was a good chunk above what Celine had. Curious. How? Why? Why did he have this? Why did he call it her, why was he protecting it? Intriguing, so very intriguing. I pulled the shiny blue gem into my hand, having had it floating around me like a little moon. Now, why would I do such a thing when most things were straining on this low-power mode human form? Because it seemed to infuriate Bob to no end. Ding, personality trait unlocked, sadism. I'd have thought these shitheads would go into hibernation in low-power mode. Don't waste energy on bullshit. You know, I caressed the thing, gently. I thought I'd have to take one of these off a fuckwood Eldar that decided to fuck around, but this is just what I need right now. So Bob, I think you deserve a reward for generously giving this to me, and I think I know just the thing you'd want, I smirked at him. Objectively speaking, I am probably among the four best flesh crafters in this galaxy. His eyes flew wide and his struggling calmed down. I think I know what you want, but I haven't bothered looking too deeply into your mind so I want you to tell me just to be sure, I slowly removed his face mask made up of solidified psychic power. Green Lantern had nothing on these force objects. I want to hear you say it. Bring her back, he wheezed, eyes going bloodshot as he stared without blinking. Bring her back. By that you mean, I placed a hand on my hips and started playfully throwing the gem up and catching it. Please oh so mighty being, forge a new body for the unfortunate soul, trapped in that spirit stone, right? Or is it more like, Please make a new body for my steaming hot totally not heretical Eldar girlfriend, I hadn't gotten laid in over a century. His mouth fell open, then closed. He repeated that for a while, mimicking a fish out of the water. Even his wide eyes are matching. How? Dumb question, I chided him. I asked you a question. Please, he scrunched his eyes. Give her back to me. Fine, I rolled my eyes. 
I'll take pity on you this once, I will accept that answer. He slumped in my hold, stopping his struggling for the first time since I laid eyes on him. Now then, I rolled my shoulders and cracked my neck. Will you be a good boy if I drop you Bob? Yes, he said, his face twisting as if he bit into an unripe lemon. Good. I dropped him. Let's get walking then, group. It is a long walk from here back to the surface. Then we were off with me leading the way and the other three following after me a few meters back, though Bob kept some distance from the mother-daughter pair. My clock was ticking, I wanted to summon up my refreshment bioenergy from my puddle ASAP. Then I could go about fiddling with souls, and maybe by the end of it I'll have a way to not only shove that Eldar soul back into a living body, but also to fix Celine's problem. Because that's what it was, if you haven't realized already. Bob here was protecting a spirit stone like his life depended on it, just like the one Val had embedded into his clothes around his chest. Though, his was purplish and not sapphire blue like this one. Fun times ahead. How would the Eldar react to seeing my real soul in its entirety when I shove it into my puddle? Will she freak out? Proclaim me the incarnation of one of her dead gods? Or will she just do slash say something entirely stupid and idiotic? I was leaning towards the last one based on my not too extensive knowledge of Eldar lore, Dalaneth was far too normal and had far too much common sense compared to the Eldar I'd read about. Basing your actions on idiotic visions of the future that won't even come to pass is the go-to plan for most Eldar. There was that time when they sent an entire group of rangers just to kill the baby Primarch Ron when he crash-landed on Nusiria just because their farcer saw a future version of him wreck some Eldar. Now, this seems entirely relatable and understandable right? But as it turns out, killing a baby per march is beyond the capabilities of a centuries-old trained group of Eldar rangers. Yes, they failed to kill a damned baby, but they managed to weaken him enough so when human slavers found him, he couldn't resist capture. And that was the start of his path down a spiraling path of anger and destruction, which also included wrecking more than some Eldar. Idiots. Good thing I was better than them, there was no farcer who could exceed my stellar foresight. Ding, snort foresight. Oh shut up. I glared at nothing in particular, my feet stomping just a bit stronger than before which made the little girl jump up in fright. Oops, sorry, I threw a smile back. What did they do to that poor thing to have her react to just that little expression of annoyance? Caverns turned and bent, but we kept on walking, even the little girl was coming along on her own two legs with a growing feeling of vitality, probably not having been able to even stand for a good while before I alleviated her ailments. I ooed as the flickering light of a far-off torch sent long shadows over the walls, contesting with my tiny orb of light which floated along a few centimeters above my head. 79 A much-needed refueling. So let me get this straight. She gave me a dubious look. A sixty-million-year-old crazy Necron overlord who likes to collect curious things locked you in a time stasis and ran off with your main body. I nodded. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. I shrugged. Nothing? Nothing. I nodded again. There is nothing to do, nothing I can do at the moment. Wasn't your main body important? Not really, I shrugged. The only thing that'll be bothersome to replicate will be the soulbone skeleton, but that's just going to need me to sit down and meditate for an afternoon. I see, she said with a raised eyebrow, obviously not quite believing that I'd let the matter rest, just like that, and she was right. That tin can would get his due in time, but as of right now, I couldn't do shit to him. So, I clapped, turning around as our conversation came to a close. Oh very good, we have some aspiring test subjects, who only have the faintest traces of corruption. Tell me young lady, how long have you been a cultist? The skin and bones woman who only wore some rags in the same color as the cult's banner stilled as I hopped up to her and pulled her to her feet with a touch of TK. She was unfortunately far too frightened to answer my question, so I just shrugged. Alas, it seems I am not to know thine secrets, I mused, twirling her around in the air and putting her into the middle of the hall. Ah, I almost forgot. I'm going to need some refreshments, before doing this. 
I left the woman hanging as I floated out of the hole. Can you monitor them so they don't run off? Sure. Celine shrugged. Thanks. I came to float over the opening and started channeling bioenergy through my body. The energy rushed through me, slowly growing faster or slowing down until I reached a steady base in it. Then I gave it a vibration. The tones I knew were matched easily and the symphony of the crotalids resonated in my body. The crescendo came about in a few seconds, and I only had a moment to realize that this might not have been one of my greatest ideas. A chunk of that condensed biomass sphere I kept orbiting my soul appeared in real space, just as I wanted it to, but with my body being the center of what was basically a summoning ritual, it appeared in my body. I doubled over, my human senses protesting the head-sized object inserting itself between my guts. I'm such an idiot. I wheezed as I pushed my tendrils to absorb the new biomass. The disturbing feeling abetted quickly, and with a sigh, I sent out my replenished bioenergy to remake my body. In the blink of an eye, my human body morphed into my psyker form in all but the skeletal structure which now had a stand-in I made by mixing a bit of tyranid bone structure with the Eldar one. My mind cleared up and I could feel the change in my emotions. Sympathy and natural human empathy dimmed and gave way for the baseline Eldar emotional spectrum. Some might say that the space elves only felt more, but there was a deep-seated sadism built into their very genes. That could be counterproductive. I purged it and along with that went the sudden urge to make the tests, to become far more painful for my subjects than they needed to be. Pragmatism was preferable to unreasonable sadism, though I didn't think it made me any less of an asshole for what I was about to do to them. I fell down. TK dampening my velocity and laying me down on the floor gently. All right, I grinned. Let's see. First thing first, I promised some healing to you, didn't I? The malnourished little girl gave me a look, not unlike what Celine gave me recently, looking at me like I grew another head or something. I threw a glance at Celine, who, contrary to her previous look, appeared relieved. Hmm, anyway. Here you go. I poked her in the forehead and my twin energies rushed into her body. Before topping myself off, this amount of energy could have remade my human body from nothing but right now, I barely noticed the loss of it. My internal counter showed a loss of about 0.0001% of my current energy reserves. The girl shivered and her mother grabbed onto her shoulders, helping her stand upright as I rebuilt her weak body to the best it could have been. She grew twenty centimeters, her bones grew denser, and her muscles swelled while fat gathered in all the right places. Her skin tightened on her newly gained muscle mass and gained a slightly rosy tint even with the more dark color that was the norm among the wasteland dwellers. I looked her up and down. My soul energy settled into her body, reinvigorating organs and reinforcing her flickering vitality. She should be good now. Even if most of the sympathy I felt for her left me by now, a promise was a promise. Looks good. I nodded to myself. Want to make any changes? Since I am having a great day so far, I am willing to give you a little something extra. Change? The girl said absently, looking down at her new body in bewilderment. I nodded. Hair color, skin color, do you want eyes that look like liquid gold or do you want pointy ears? I, uh, she looked up at me with uncertainty. Can you make me strong? Strong is subjective. I tilted my head. How strong? I want to protect mommy. Her mother pulled her back into a tight hug. Where moments ago the girl barely reached her chest, she now stood at eye level with her mother, so the scene looked different. You don't need to. She whispered to her. Please don't change my daughter. Ah well. I shrugged. This should help if you don't want any touch-up. Another flick later, she had bioenergy coursing through her body and reinforcing it. She wouldn't be giving any hard fights to Astartes with that, but it should make dealing with a small-time cult effortless. Off you go. I flicked up a portal and waved them in. Don't poke at the big men, they bite. Thank you, the mother bowed before ushering her daughter through the portal, which hissed, close behind them. Why did you do that? Celine asked, her face betraying nothing about her feelings. 
helping them? I asked and received a nod. Call it a whim, I lost barely anything from it and they kicked my barely existing sympathy into working order for a bit. Seeing the slight frown on her face I gave her a look. There is a difference between feeling sympathy for you and for a regular person, Celine. Though I feel this body is not quite the best vessel for sympathy. What's up with it? She let her gaze wash over me, lingering in places. It's mostly Eldar. I twirled around. Didn't I say that already? Hmm, I thought I did? Eldar? She looked up at my face, curiously, evaluating. The face doesn't really match. I don't really like the whole androgynous facial structure they have going on. I shrugged. Would this help? My ears morphed, growing longer and their tips ending in a point. They weren't as long as regular Eldar ears, but they were still twice as long from the ear canal to the tip than they were before. I had to admit that they had a certain fantastical appeal to them. These ears go well with the whole supernatural beauty thing I am going for. I think I'll keep it. I smiled, ears flopping down a bit as I did. Oh, they move like that, hmm, nice. I wiggled my ears up and down while Celine stared at me going at it. The cultists? You wanted to do experiments, right? She asked with a fake cough, though I noticed her cheeks were slightly flushed. Oh, do you want pointy ears too? I wiggled my eyebrows at her. I can give you some, I won't even need to change your genetic template for it much. No. She gave me a weak glare. Your loss. I shrugged. Then I turned to the cultists and Bob who watched our byplay with varying degrees of astonishment. All right ladies and gentlemen, let's get this thing started. Sorry for leaving you hanging like that. A flick of my wrist pulled the unfortunate first test subject in front of me, the woman biting off a scream as I dragged her through the air. The skin on my forehead parted and my vertical third eye brimming with liquid white light opened up, staring down at the woman but seeing something very different from what my regular eyes showed. Though, just to be sure, I channeled some soul energy into my right eye too to get a third perspective on her. Human souls were weird to me. Especially with the context I had to compare what I was seeing to. There were all the spiritualist mambo-jumbo back on earth that I heard of for one and while I never quite embraced those worldviews, my mother was a staunch believer in that everyone had a soul and an aura. I couldn't help but grimace as I remembered her. We weren't too close and even if we met, she was more like a bothersome bigger sister that was just around and came for a visit to bother me than an actual parent. Maternal obligations weren't really her thing. Still, I had her spiritualist babble still swirling around in my head, and as annoying as it was to admit it, it was right on more accounts than it was not. Souls were real here, and so were auras, those two things were facts to me by now, and auras worked similarly to how I expected them. Souls were different. I'd have imagined them to be like an overlaid imprint on the body, or something like how ghosts were depicted in children's cartoons but souls were more complicated here, especially human ones. The only other thing I could compare them to was my soul. It floated about in the immaterium and a thread connected it to my body. Humans didn't have soul threads, and neither did they have their souls entirely in the immaterium. The human soul was inside their body, at the center of their being and the central foundation for their minds, but at the same time it was an imprint left on the immaterium. That was the confusing part. Human souls seemed to exist at two places at once, in real space and in the warp. I narrowed my eyes, all three of them boring into the cultist whose soul was already close to being snuffed out, it flickered violently as she stared at me wide-eyed and then she went still. Just when I was about to mark this as the first failure and grab the next subject I stopped. Her soul stabilized and the soul I sensed in her body shimmered out of existence and melded together with the one in the warp. Then came the ravenous monsters. Right as the soul flickered into life again in the warp, a swarm of what I saw as bloodthirsty fish-like beings ripped it apart. Each monster bit at the rapidly dimming soul until there was nothing left. That was the harsh fate of every single human that lived, to die and be ripped apart by demons. This woman for instance, was especially unfortunate. 
She was a simple human with a weak soul, so if no monsters chomped down on her soul for only a few seconds, her soul would have disintegrated into pure warp energy, and she wouldn't have had to face oblivion in the most agonizing way possible. The Emperor Protects A dark smirk crossed my lips. There was nothing out there in that dangerous ocean that was willing to protect insignificant little souls like these. The only ones the big golden god emperor of mankind protected were those who were worth the effort to wrestle for them with the demonic quartet. That wasn't what interested me though, I knew that any unprotected soul would be ripped apart after death, but what I wasn't sure of was the why. Why were they only vulnerable after the physical body died? I absorbed the cultist's corpse without giving it another look, only grimacing inside as my soul energy obliterated the lingering warp taint. Still feels like someone is vomiting into my whole body. A flick of my wrist pulled the next unfortunate subject in front of me who screamed silently with his gaze transfixed by my third eye. Oh well, it wasn't like I liked screamers anywhere outside of the bedroom. I slowly pushed a glob of soul energy into him and scouted around, finding his soul, in short order. Humans were like an onion. The outermost layer was the body. Then came the mindscape and at the center of it all was the soul. Of course you couldn't find the soul if you cut a human in half, I checked, but for anyone with some skill in telepathy, piercing through those layers was doable, if not effortless. My tiny thread of energy moved with great care, poking around someone's mindscape and soul carelessly had the unfortunate side effect of either sending them into a seizure, shock or outright making them catatonic if the telepath used their powers more like a drill than a scalpel. Humans are fragile. Thankfully, gazing into my third I didn't have the textbook reaction on the humans, which was instant raving madness or catatonic shock. He just stared into them like he just laid his eyes on something so beautiful that his mind blanked out and he couldn't make himself tear his gaze away from it. Works for me. I poke around his soul, my third eye watching the mirror image of said soul in the warp like a hawk for any changes. Whatever I did to the soul here, happened to the soul there. Now, the question was whether that was the same the other way around too. I suspected the answer was no, otherwise the monsters wouldn't wait for a soul to die. Most of them didn't exhibit enough forward thinking to just wait around so when the two souls merged, they'd get a double-sized meal. They were mindless, ravenous monsters. These humans were far too powerless to attract anything with even a semblance of intelligence. Then I let a single droplet of soul energy suffuse his, real, soul, and all hell broke loose around his immaterial soul. The monsters came, biting, chewing, nibbling and fighting amongst themselves, but despite their best attempts, the human only shivered as if a frigid chill rushed down his spine. That is one hypothesis proven. Let's get started on the rest. A wide grin spread across my face. 80. Doing some R&D. I clicked my tongue as I absently absorbed the fourteenth failed test subject as I watched its soul disintegrate into warp energy. There was much I'd learned already, but I still didn't feel all too close to a solution. The most important thing I'd learned was that the second soul for humans which was in the warp wasn't real, it was just an imprint. If the real soul inside their mortal bodies was the moon, then the imprint in the warp was it reflecting off on a still lake. The water might get muddled if you poked at the moon's reflection, but that wouldn't do anything to the moon itself. The second thing I'd learned was even if the human was just a regular old human with zero psychic powers, the imprint in the warp and their souls were connected. That connection was faint and nothing could be transmitted through it, but it was enough for warp-based beings to sense them through it. This connection was also what guided the real soul after its mortal vessel was gone. When the body died, the imprint basically summoned the soul to itself. I stared down at the soul in my psychic grasp. It was tugging against me, wanting to go towards the imprint in the warp, but I was holding on to it firmly. This little soul was in much the same situation as that Eldar stuck in the spirit stone even if the soul in my grasp needed me to keep holding on to it to remain in real space. It wasn't disintegrating at least, so that was something. The idiotic urge to just see what happens if I just dragged it through my soul thread and into my soul puddle was edging me on, but I knew that even in the best circumstance, that'd just create a connection between where the imprint was and my soul puddle. Which is why I called that urge idiotic, but I was getting rather irritated with how little I accomplished. 
I learned some interesting stuff and came up with a list of ideas to try, but my current test subjects weren't fit to test them. I needed psychers. No. What if pulling the soul into my puddle drags the imprint along with it? But what would that help me, if I did that to Celine she wouldn't be able to control an avatar like I do? What I needed was for just the imprint to move into my puddle. For a psyker, that would by reasonable logic, change where they drew their powers from, from the warp to my puddle. I stared down at the Eldar spirit stone. There was no way I could reach through the flimsy connection a human soul had with its imprint and move the imprint about, but if the connection was strong enough to maintain a permanent tunnel between the two that could change. I threw the soul away, letting it be pulled to the imprint as I walked over to Selene. There were still six perfectly alive cultists, so losing a single soul would not hurt, especially now that I knew there wasn't much else to be gained from studying them. Selene sat, not too far away from where I was experimenting, she had her legs crossed and her eyes only now popped open from meditation as I walked up to her. Yes? She asked. It's nothing really, I hummed. I just want to take a look at how different your soul is from theirs, nothing intrusive just yet though. I just want to look, all right? You want to read my mind? She asked with a raised eyebrow, more curious than outraged. No, I said. I am curious about that tunnel that connects you to the warp. Okay, she shrugged. Do I need to do anything? I am, um, not sure, I poked my cheek in thought, my head tilting to the side. You might feel my aura brush against your mind. If you don't lash out or anything like that out of reflex, then it should be fine? Should be? It will be fine. I nodded, though I might have felt more convinced than I sounded. So can I? Sure. She shrugged. She closed her eyes again, and I saw her body relax along with her mind. I pushed only my awareness into her mindscape through my aura and took a glimpse into that tunnel. That was enough for me to zero in on her soul imprint in the warp with my third eye, not that I couldn't have done that before, but right now I had the full picture. Her body, her mind, her soul, the connection, and the imprint. Celine's soul dwarfed the flickering candle lights of the cultists, but it still paled, compared to a librarian, for example. The connection was stable too, yet somewhat flexible. The warp and real space were two faces of the same coin, but they weren't perfectly aligned and fitting for each other so the bridge connecting the two had to have a sort of elasticity to it. Which means it shouldn't break if I move it. I pulled back out. You're done? Celine blinked up at me, seeming a bit out of it, but she recovered in a few seconds. Yes, I said. For now, I am. I'm going to see whether what I have in mind works on this one. If it does? Then I can do it to you too. I gave her a smile. If this works, you could draw from the same pool of energy I do. That, she said, would be great. There was relief in her voice. I didn't know how straining it could be to have voices speaking to you, trying to taint and corrupt you every time while the source of your power was more addictive than the worst drugs humans ever cooked up. I gave her shoulder a firm squeeze, which earned me a genuine smile. The spirit stone floated up from my hands as I stepped back into the center of the room and I noticed Bob stiffening up in the corner, but for now he just watched on. First, I pulled another cultist up to me though, and even before they could scream or curse me, a single telepathic spike to their mind blasted apart their psyche. As I said before, I didn't like it when they screamed and making them vegetables was the easiest solution to that problem. I reached deeply into the ruins of his mind and pulled the soul at the center of it out and into my grasp, then I absorbed the body. A quick analysis later, I recreated it and shoved the soul back into the body, just as it was before. Of course that wasn't enough to put the cultist back onto the list of the living and I grabbed his naughty soul before it could slip into the warp. It needed to be fixed to the body. How? I pulled another cultist towards me and with a single thought. I obliterated this one's mind too, though I didn't even leave ruins of it this time. The soul stayed inside the body, it felt less entrenched in it, but it stayed, nonetheless. What else fixes the soul to the body? What was different with the body I remade? My vision stared down at the two bodies, 
one capable of holding on to a soul and while the other was not. Is it just impossible? No. Drukari could do it and I know the old Eldari before Slanish could also do it. What am I not seeing? Ding, recommendation, try using bioenergy, vitality, as the adhesive. Oh. Boohoo. That was right, wasn't it? Humans and anything that was alive had vitality, some life force in them and with me being as efficient, red, stingy, with my bioenergy, the body I recreated only had just enough energy to build itself one, no leftovers. I stared at the comatose, but very alive cultist, my eyes making out every little vein and pulse of vitality in his body, noting everything and sending it all to my mind cores for analysis. The response came in less than a second, a comprehensive information package of how vitality most likely functioned to stick body and soul together. I replicated that and shoved the soul back into the still body. It stuck. I grinned. It worked. Then I constructed a rudimentary mind around the soul. If the vitality was the adhesive that held the two together, the mind was more like structural support to keep a stronger wind from tearing the two parts apart. Doing this was possible only because the soul acted sort of like a black box for the individual, containing everything important about them. I couldn't quite remake the body just from the soul, but remaking a simple mind that resembled the original required me only letting energy flow into the soul, and it did that by itself. The mind sprouted from the soul like a sapling would from a seed. The reborn cultist groaned, his body trembling once before his eyes snapped open. He jumped to his feet, eyes wide and bloodshot as he glanced around. Then he laid his eyes on me. I gave him a friendly smile. He had a heart attack. Shame. I reabsorbed him. Still, a success is a success. Then, finally, I decided to get on with it and attempt giving this Eldar a new body. I reached into the glimmering gem and pulled out the soul inside. Why it hadn't dissipated or had been pulled into the warp became apparent when the damned gem was pulling the soul back much stronger than any soul I ever felt tried to pull towards the warp. The spirit stone simply had a stronger attracting force than the soul could escape by itself. Not that I didn't overpower it when I pushed just a touch more will into the action. The soul came free and the spirit stone clattered to the ground, its light dimming immediately but the fascinating soul captivated me. The Eldar soul was so very different from the human ones in ways that I couldn't put into words. It was also rather powerful, about on par with the strongest librarians I felt aside from Mephiston of course. It also had an intact mind structure around it. A mind structure which I saw ever so slowly fading. A quick rush of soul energy reinvigorated it and regrew the missing parts. Now to give it a body. How did your girlfriend look? I asked Bob without looking at him. Eh, he made a dumb sound. She dash, she had golden blonde hair and sapphire blue eyes and stood a head taller than me. Anything else? I asked. This idiot isn't good at descriptions. She had a, angular face? Every Eldar has an angular face. I remarked. I had a picture, he gulped. But the cultists took it from me, it should be somewhere here if you just give me a few minutes, dash. Don't bother. My aura spread out, soul energy spilling into every nook and cranny of the cultist hideout until I found a single little picture depicting a twenty-something bob along with an Eldar with roughly the same descriptions as he gave me. She was smiling, and somehow that looked odd on an Eldar, but it seemed genuine. So fucking weird. My mind core spat out a reworked Eldar template which should cause a body perfectly resembling the woman, at least as much as I could make it with as little information as I had of her. Maybe she had a mole on her back. Whatever. A small tendril loaded with twice the bioenergy needed jumped out of my held-out palm and landed on the ground, from there it started building. Bones, muscles, organs, nervous system, whatever else before lastly covering the body with skin and finishing it with growing out the hair and nails. Does it match? I asked, but Bob just stood there with tears streaming down his face, he gave me a slow, shaky nod. I covered the body with the same clothing I had on for decency's sake, if I was her, 
I wouldn't want to be reborn bare as a newborn after being a dead soul shoved into a gem for a century or more. The lingering bioenergy moved in the body, the patterns were different and it took a moment for me to remake them based on the Eldar body, but I had something that should work a moment later. I shoved in the soul, secured the vitality pathways into it and reinforced the mind with a surge of soul energy. Not a moment later the Eldar was on her feet, a dozen meters away from where she laid a moment ago, and looked around warily until her gaze landed on the by now ugly bawling Bob. Rob? She asked, voice sounding as annoyingly androgynous as all Eldars did, but her aura radiated something I never thought I'd see an Eldar feel for a human. Love. 81, setting up a pyramid scheme. Ah, I clapped. Very heartfelt reunion. Who are you? The woman snapped her gaze at me, already eyeing the opening in the ceiling, and I could hear the little gears turning in her head. She was confused and wanted to be away from here rather strongly. The beautiful sorceress that shoved your sorry ass back into a living body. I smiled at her. You can thank me now. Thank you? She looked down at herself, her body clad in the same silky clothes as mine. This isn't my body. Faye, said Bob, running up to the woman and wrapping her up in a hug. She stiffened up at hers then relaxed into it, giving a tentative pat to the old human's back. You are alive. Why are you old? It's been a hundred and thirty-three years, Faye, he said, tightening his hug. You were dead. I levitated the dim spirit stone up to eye level, most of its power came from the Eldar's soul held inside it, but it still had a mythical and powerful quality to it. Dead? I saw her eyes fixate on the blue gem. How? Poison, Bob spat. They knew they couldn't beat you so they poisoned the well. The woman frowned, clearly not quite able to come to terms with her situation, just yet. Unfortunately for her, I wanted to get on with it. Tell her the important part, Bob. I've been trying to bring you back for all these years, and despite asking everyone from farcers to powerful psychers, only this woman succeeded. Her? Her eyes narrowed on me. Who are you? Very rude. I rolled my eyes. I go by Echidna. How? Magic. What? Call it a pact then. I shrugged. Better with me than a demon, though not by much. I also have a price you'll have to pay for it. What? She grabbed onto Bob and I could see that she was ready to bounce any moment. Silly girl, you can't escape me. I am having an experiment here. I raised my chin proudly. You see, I have this beautiful partner here. I pointed at Celine behind me with my thumb who looked on with the same stone-faced expression I saw her take on during my meeting with Dante. And since she is a psyker, I am trying to make it so she could draw her power from me instead of the warp. What does that have to do with me? I have no idea whether my method will work, so I am testing it on you first. Now she shook her head and glared at me. Yes. I gave her a wicked grin. I saved your soul from existing in a dubious state of limbo until a demon finally snatched it from the cold dead hands of your little human lover there, this is the least you could do dear. What if I won't? She asked. I am not giving you much of a choice on this matter. I shrugged. Oh, well, maybe this will help convince you. I have a task for you Val. I sent through our telepathic link. What is it? He sent back, not a second later. I'm going to summon you. Was all the warning he got before I opened up a portal under his feet and connected it to one next to me. Damn dash he cursed under his breath, but landed on his feet, then he dusted off his clothes, and turned to me with an inquisitively raised eyebrow. Convince her to become my test subject. I pointed at the Eldar woman, and Val, followed my finger. Who is this? He asked with a frown as he beheld the Eldar hugging an old human in ragged, stinky clothes. What experiment? I think Bob, the human there, called her Faye. I tapped my chin. I just yanked her soul out of this and shoved it into a body. I want to test my idea of how to change the source of a psyker's power from the warp to me. I see. He nodded, 
and the human illusion flaked away from him. I could also feel a glimmer of excitement bubble up inside of him. It was good to have at least someone as enthusiastic about becoming my test subject as he was. I am Valeneth, disciple of Farser Eldred Ulthrin of Ulfwi. Introduce yourself. Faelarian Don Whisper. The woman eyed Val with as much wariness as surprise. I am from the maiden world of Sephiroth. Sephiroth, Sephiroth, where do I know that name from? Sounds familiar. Ding, Data, Serenade, known to the Necrons as Sephiroth and to the Eldar as Sephiroth, is a world located on the eastern fringe. History The world was originally part of the Necronter race and became a tomb world for the Immunos dynasty. According to legend, it became the resting place of their last pharaoh, Nephrith. Oh. Oh. That was where Trazen found the shard of the deceiver. My condolences then. I smiled at the woman. What? She gave me a look. Are you sure you only had her in that gem for a single century? I turned to Bob. Eldar Exodites haven't stepped foot on Sephiril for eight thousand years. I left the planet long ago. She frowned, her gaze snapping to me. What did you mean by that? Doesn't matter. Sephiril is a chunk of lifeless rock and it has been such for a good while now if I remember correctly. Faelarian. Dalaneth interrupted the barrage of questions visibly sitting on the tip of her tongue. What this woman offers you is of indescribable significance, if she succeeds, you might free your soul. You might never again need to carry a soul stone. If. She hissed. Why don't you do it? I could? He turned his gaze on me, a touch wary, but I could tell he was willing to throw himself on the metaphorical operating table. I'd rather test it first on someone I value less. I shrugged. I see. Val nodded. This is a chance for you to free yourself, did you never wonder what it could have been like before the fall? This is an opportunity to glimpse that, to regain a fragment of the power we once held. How likely is it to work? She asked after a few seconds of deliberation. Fuck me if I know. I shrugged. I am trying two things, one could royally fuck up what I have going and the other might royally fuck you up. You are not making a convincing argument. Celine whispered into my ear. Couldn't you just tell her it should work? Not like she has a choice. I shrugged. No use lying when her choice just saves me the annoyance of having to sedate her. You could get a loyal follower if she did this willingly. If you forced her into this, wouldn't that just be a liability to you? It would. I eyed the Eldar. I could just tear her connection apart after I know it worked though. That would kill her. It would. I nodded and while Faye showed no sign of having heard our conversation, I doubted she hadn't. Those ears weren't just for show. You are not making my task any easier. Val grumbled. Then he went still for a moment before a smile spread on his face. It wasn't the gentle smile Faye gave to Bob, but a predatory smile a wolf gave to a cornered rabbit. Say Faelarian, I noticed you care for that human deeply. Yes. Faye answered his not question warily. Unfortunately, he seems to be at the end of his life, human regeneration treatment and whatever else kept him alive this far has a limit and I can tell he is reaching that limit. She glanced down at Bob's weathered face marred with wrinkles, then back up at Val. I presume it wouldn't be too much to ask to return the human to his prime in return for Faelarian undergoing your experiment willingly, would it? Val turned to me with the same wolfish smile on his face, and I couldn't help but mirror it myself. That is certainly doable, barely an effort on my part. Consider it done if you go along with my experiment. I see. She bit her lips. What do you think? Are they telling the truth? I could make out the hushed whispers she spoke into Bob's ears. I think they are. He answered as silently as he could. I saw her turn a girl at the door of death into a woman more fit and healthy than me at my prime. I agree. She said after a second of thought, letting go of Bob and stepping closer to me. What should I do? Nothing for now, first try goes to one of these shitheads. I smirked and dragged a screaming cultist up to me. 
You can sit back and relax for now, or whatever. This won't take a minute. A single thought blasted away the mortal shell covering the human soul, which I wrapped up in a psychic cocoon. Then, I forced it through my soul thread, which I widened just enough to pull it through. My grin widened as I watched the imprint of his soul move inside the warp, slowly moving in directions incomprehensible to the human mind, but my soul saw it slowly crawl through the ocean below and crawl up to the surface where it stopped. I frowned. Do I really need to make a connection? I decided to just drag the soul further onward and see what happens. When the human soul finally popped out of the soul thread, a faint connection formed between the imprint and it, that I could feel even through my avatar. Shit. Clawed arms latched onto the connection, trying to drag themselves up through it into my personal little pocket, but it was far too faint to support them. The connection didn't snap, but I knew that it just existing connected me with the warp and that was something I really didn't want. My soul kicked the human soul out of my puddle and I watched it plop back down into the warp where it dissipated. Okay, this idea is a no-go. I either need the connection or I need to do something else. I formed a brief connection on my next test and I couldn't help but grin as the imprint stuck at the edges of my puddle even after I yanked the soul of the second cultist back into real space. The imprint still tries to go back to the warp but it can't without a connection. Hmm. This could be a problem when I tried to go for a refill. My soul swam up to the flimsy little soul, and I switched my entire perception to it. I extended my ethereal hand and pinched the little candlelight between my fingers. I held onto it as carefully as I could, channeling a bit of soul energy into it to keep it alive as I narrowed my eyes at it. How could I touch this thing? I wasn't too sure, but I chalked it up to the amateurish reality warping my soul could seemingly do. With the imprint being right next to it, I didn't need to use a tiche to channel that ability through it. I need to fix this thing in place. The spirit stone and its pseudo-gravitational well came to mind, and I decided to mimic that. According to my will, the puddle surged around my soul. In here, I wasn't just a god, but the god. All the tiny realms forming in my puddle were beholden to my will, and everything inside it obeyed me with a fervor you could only find in the most fanatical followers of the emperor. Not that anything living was inside of it yet. I was curious how it would affect the rather confrontational Eldar though, seeing my soul in its entirety, and not just the puppet I controlled in real space. I drew on a large amount of the soul energy in my puddle and used it to form a single new realm inside of here. I grinned as a forest sprang up around me made of nothing but pure energy, and the few streamlined houses and buildings that built themselves up in between them, not breaking the natural beauty of the place. Around the whole forest realm, I created a barrier, which would hopefully keep the souls inside. I let go of the little soul imprint and watched it slowly drift towards the edges of the realm, but it stopped. Perfect. I snapped my perception back to my avatar and watched on as the two Eldar stared at me with mouths agape and eyes wide. Though Val shook himself out of it after I snapped my fingers in front of his face. Still magnificent. He murmured. Fay dear. I intoned as I hopped up to the golden-haired Eldar. Time for your operation. Ah? She blinked olishly at me. Yes? What do I do? First things first. Can you project your mind into the warp and move around in there? I should be capable of it, but I heard it's very dangerous. She glanced at Val, who nodded along. Doing so makes you susceptible to attacks coming from the denizens of the warp, which few can ward off with any reliability. I see. I nodded. So the only holdup is the danger. There are two ways we can do this. 1. I tear your soul out like I did with that cultist, throw it through my soul thread, and let your imprint swim up through another connection, before I pull your soul back and stitch it back into your body. The second? She gulped. I make the connection, and you travel up on it by yourself. I evaluated her. I can somewhat protect you, but some dipshit demon might snatch you up, before I can help. I am not sure how grumpy the Prince of Pleasure will be with me stealing his meal, so there might be some rather rowdy demons coming for you. I would like to try the second one. She said resolutely. Good. 
I grinned. Let's get started on your ascension, dot. 82, Friendly Neighborhood, Stalker. Mephiston. The chief librarian froze midwalk, gathering some curious glances from the other occupants of the street, but he went back to his previous stride without as much as a change in his severe expression. For a single moment there, he felt his senses expand into something new, something entirely foreign to him, but it closed not a moment later. All he got was a single lick of the sensation that this new section of what he assumed was the warp felt like. He'd felt both corruption and purity before, both chaos and order. He was well versed in the intricacies of the warp and many of its deepest secrets were known to him, still, no one could truly know everything. Mephiston was young. He knew there were other librarians who were his seniors, and he didn't doubt that those who put themselves into the service of the god of magic knew any less than himself. Even so. When something was right in front of him or so close to him as this phenomena felt, very few things ever managed to so effortlessly slip out of his grasp. Curiously, this phenomenon had the same taste to it as what he felt wafting off of that mysterious woman. This must be her doing. He concluded with a thoughtful look. What exactly was it that he felt though? What had she done? He felt her power more clearly for a moment there than he did when she stood right in front of him and it wasn't just something as mundane as removing a cloaking technique from her soul. What he felt was more than any single mortal sorceress could ever be. It was just more. He went back to going about his day as he would have been anyway, brooding over the strange phenomena and what it could mean in the back of his mind throughout his other duties. For now, he was to stay back in the fort while the chapter master continued to take sorties out and prepare for the possibility of another monster similar to that swarm lord showing up. Mephiston was rather confident in his capability of taking down the monster, but he acquiesced to the chapter master's idea of preparing a ritual for such an eventuality. He understood that putting either himself or the commander in as a precarious situation as facing down that monster again could mean the end of their resistance here. Mephiston couldn't let that happen. He knew how Tyranids operated, kill, eat, evolve. He also knew that under his feet was a chapel more sacred than any to the bloodline of the Great Angel, as it was the final resting place of the Primarch. He faced the possibility of the Primarch's remains falling into the maws of the Xenomenus numerous times during his meditations, and he didn't like any of the possible futures that laid out before humanity. There were already bioforms who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Commander Dante, who he counted amongst the finest warriors of humanity. If those beasts got their claws on the genetic material of a Primarch and used that to better themselves could any warrior stand in their way and expect anything other than a gruesome death? No. He didn't think so. The primary ritual he prepared was for when he fell in battle. That ritual would cause the utter annihilation of the entire fortress along with the sacred chapel below. It was a disastrously unfilial ritual and the thought of defiling his gene fathers remained so saddened him, but it was the obviously superior alternative to letting it strengthen the enemies of humanity. He could only wish for forgiveness after his death, if he was allowed even that, being the avatar of the Dark Angel. Not an hour after the first phenomena Mephiston felt that same tingle run down his spine, and he immediately made for his personal chamber, pushing both brothers and regular humans out of his way as he rushed through the fortress. Back in his chambers, he sat down and let his mind slip away from his mortal shell. By the next time he opened up his eyes, he was in an ethereal replica of his own body floating along the currents of the warp. He made for the source of the phenomenon, he felt it more clearly now. The connection or whatever this was, felt more stable. When he first laid his eyes upon the source of the phenomenon, he couldn't quite tell what he was looking at. He stopped a good while away from where he could clearly observe monstrous beings of varying sizes rushing at the source, but not a single one of them made it all the way to it. Arching whips of pure energy which snapped out, obliterating either parts of the monsters or unmaking them entirely whenever it touched them. None of them seemed to care, these were mostly mindless warp beings and some demons from the lowest echelons of their orders. He glanced around and he could feel concealed auras all around himself, though none were as adept at hiding their presence as he was so he reasoned they should be unaware of his presence. Hopefully, the woman who made this phenomenon was also the same. 
One approaching aura stood out from the rest and Mephiston watched it as it moved closer to the source much like the monsters. Few of them paid the bright soul much attention, transfixed as they were with the phenomena, but the few that did were dealt with in short order by the soul itself. Psyker. Feels like an Eldar. About Upper Delta. Not that the denomination meant much for an Eldar. Theirs was a miserable existence of having the power to bend reality and being unable to do so lest they pay for that power with their souls. Farsers tended to be beta-level psychers, which were the strongest a regular human could theoretically reach. Very few beta-level human psychers ever had a sound mind, the whispers of the warp and the machinations of the demons breaking them before they could ever learn to control their powers. He watched on curiously as the soul slowed, it seemed to deliberate just at the edge of where the arcs of energy first struck out. Monsters stepping past each lasted no longer than a blink, the larger ones advanced further in that time and yet they too ended up being sent back into the depths of the warp. None could fault him for the astonishment he felt when despite common sense the soul moved forward. He almost reflexively sent out a pulse of power to send it back, but he held himself back. The soul wasn't his to save. If it wanted to face oblivion instead of an eternity of torture at the hands of demons, he wasn't one to fault it. The soul moved and despite demons and monsters alike flaking away into nothingness all around it, not a single arc of energy as much as grazed it. He narrowed his eyes. A demon came close, somehow more intent on taking a bite out of the soul than rushing to its death like others of its kind, but as it bounded forward as much as three arcs of energy smashed into it and obliterated it. The soul moved on, unharmed and dare he say, protected by the phenomena. He stared at the center of it all, at the source of this phenomenon and the center point of this orb of death. A rift was there, not unlike the ones made by warp drives, to open a portal into the warp. It hurt his eyes to look at it. His senses were somehow proving uncomprehending of the true nature of what he was beholding, and a part of him knew that his mind was turning the incomprehensible into something his mortal mind could process. So a rift. He couldn't truly know what he saw as a rift, could be underneath that veil his mind used to protect itself, but he dared to guess. A gateway. He could feel an impression from it, similar to how smaller realms inside the warp felt but this was like a bundle of realms smashed together in a larger one. Despite his expertise and power, he held no hope for peering into the depths of this mysterious realm, which felt entirely untainted by not only chaos but the warp itself. He squinted as the soul touched the rift and disappeared into it with no sign of it ever having been there. Was this rift made just for that single soul, to pass through? He concluded that it had not when the rift remained even after what he felt were twenty Terran minutes, passed. Then came another soul. This one had a faintly familiar aura to it which he matched with the Eldar warlock he noticed going around the fortress under an illusionary guise. Much like the previous soul, this one was also unharmed by the arcs, and while it garnered more attention from the demons, it also exercised much more power and expertise in banishing each it also disappeared into the rift. He waited for the rift to close, but it stayed open which had him cast his senses far and wide for any psyker-level soul also approaching the rift. He found a single one just out of naked sight, battling with a horde of demons on its own. Like a wraith, he approached it. The horde was varied and included some regular warp monsters, but most of it comprised demons. He saw everything from nerglings, to bloodletters, to even a single herald of change all collapsing on the single human soul. Human. He let his aura lick at the soul, and he recognized the taste. Celine Voss, was it? The woman was obviously a psyker, though a new one. Her soul paled compared to the previous two and its powers left much to be desired, but it held out with a vicious ferocity banishing demons in pairs at a time but he could tell her limit was approaching. He deliberated on helping the woman, she was obviously at least moderately important to that woman, so if he wanted to put her in his debt, this would be a perfect opportunity. Would she take him being here at all, obscured and stalking, as a fence? Would it be worth it to show himself? Would the loss of this Selene even affect the woman enough to prove detrimental for the war campaign? His face hardened as he saw the force fields around the soul, starting to flicker. 
The chances were set and he would rather have charges of stalking against himself than letting someone important to the woman die. He got ready to shake off his cover and make quick work of this flimsy horde of demons, but a tingling chill ran down his ethereal spine, making him stop for a moment. In that single moment, enormous tendrils of pure white energy flooded out of the phenomena just out of sight and tore through the warp. They each came from different directions, tearing through monsters, demons, and other unexpecting observers alike. Building-sized tendrils split into thousands of tiny ones, each forming into spears that glowed with energy. Wherever they pierced demons, their incorporeal bodies vanished and their pained screeches reverberated through the warp. He watched on as the tendrils wrapped around the tiny human soul protectively. They pulled the soul back towards the rift as the other tendrils continued lashing out with vindictive malice. His eyes were fixated on something else though, not the human soul, not the whimpering farcer that got caught up in the tendrils' rampage and certainly not the obliterated demons. Mephiston watched warp energy flowing into those white tendrils and some faint red veins appeared on them for but a moment. The tendrils sucked up energy from the warp in larger quantities than he used in an entire decade. Then they retreated, pulling back into the rift and disappearing into it, much like the souls. Then the rift hissed and dimmed. Its white light phasing out of existence and leaving nothing but ruins and death in its wake. Mephiston in that moment only had a single thought. Not making an enemy of her was a good idea. Worry marred my face, a deep frown pulling my expression taut as I watched Celine's meditating body slump forward. I was there to catch her of course as she shook in my arms, letting out a long trembling breath. I would have never gone through with putting Celine through this if the other two weren't fine afterwards. Well, fine was a relative term in their case, but there seemed to be no problem I could see. Faye dropped to her hands and knees and smashed her head into the floor right after she woke up and thanked me with tears streaming down her face. Right now, she was a bit more collected but I could practically feel her veneration stream into me. Val was different. He woke up sure, he instantly checked whether he could pull on his powers and ever since then he was staring into nothingness with an idiotic grin on his face, sometimes letting out a cackle as he activated a spell using soul energy. Of course there were problems at first, the lingering warp taint in his body and the soul energy got into a fight as soon as they met and his body suffered the consequences. Not that such a thing as much as dampened his mood, he bore through it without flinching and by now, he was as pure as he could be. Now on to Celine, she was obviously exhausted from her previous fight, which I was almost a moment too late to. My reluctance to show what I was capable of to all the naughty onlookers could have cost me much, but thankfully she came out all right. Right? Celine? I nudged her, and she looked up at me, eyes wide in something between horror and astonishment. She wasn't looking at me, my body that is, but at me. Is this really you? She gulped, hand tracing up at the side of my face as her eyes finally focused on my own. Is this what you had always been? Complicated questions right off the bat. I giggled at her and pulled her into a quick hug. I wanted to reinforce that I was still the same. Now you can see me in my entirety, that is my answer to your first question, but the second one is a touch more complicated to answer. How so? She asked, blinking at me and shaking her head in an attempt to keep her focus on me. Should I put a barrier around this little forest realm that intercepts psychic senses? Let's do that. Eh? Nuu. Faye lamented in the background, though I ignored her. Dal only gave me a single glance before nodding in understanding before he went back to what I could only call playing with magic. This should help you stay in the present. I said. I don't intend to hide my nature from you, but it overwhelming you isn't something I want either, you don't need to bother with it. Okay, yeah, all right, she gave off a sigh and cracked her neck as she stepped back from me. I will need to get used to it. No more voices. No more worry. You might not need to fear possession anymore, but without that to put a limit on you, you can reach a point where your body gives out under the power flowing through it. You should keep that in mind, and you too too. I gave a glance at the Eldar. Yes. Faye nodded, slumping down to meditate, while Val gave me a nod that told me he already knew that. 
All right, I turned my undivided attention to Celine. I will help you get used to using this new source of power and your abilities, and then we should get back into the fray. I promised a day of slaughter to Dante, after all. Okay. A grin was slowly spreading on Celine's face missing the usual dark undertone of it and instead giving off a regular cheerful feeling. Let's get to it then.